We've had prayer. We've sung some songs. Now I want to get into James chapter 2. We're to a very important part. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that this chapter is written to save people. Uh, it is written so that we might know how to live and how to add to our faith to be faithful believers, faithful Christians, serving Jesus. And uh, there's a lot of practical insights here. Um, so there are several things that people just completely get hung up on and they miss the entire point and then they, they don't go on as to what the, the Bible, the, the old King James Bible uses the word perfection. Now, again, we're not going to be perfect in the sense like we think of. A perfectionist uh, in the world today is someone who has to have everything right without any problems or anything. But that's not the, the meaning of the word perfect uh, in this context in the Bible, throughout the Bible. The word perfect has to do with maturity, coming to maturity, uh, coming to being fully grown as a Christian. So um, a child grows up to perfection in the sense that they grow up to, to be an adult. And as Christians, we're supposed to grow up in the faith to a point of maturity, point of perfection. If we symbolize it, this in the idea of a, of a fruit-bearing tree, as Christians are likened unto, it is going from a sapling, right, up into a fruit-bearing tree that brings forth fruit. Uh, that is that what that's talking about. Now, I'm going to read one verse, and then we'll pray and get into the sermon this evening. The Bible says in verse 17, James 2, verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, I would say this is the key verse to the whole chapter in at least one sense, that uh, this, is the, this is the verse that basically uh, shows you what the chapter is really about, um, because many people misrepresent, misunderstand this chapter to be a chapter uh, that is teaching you how to be saved, or trying to check your salvation. Many people teach this chapter that, that what this chapter is is a litmus test and basically say that if you don't have works, then you're not saved. But what this verse does is it lays it out very clearly that faith, if it doesn't have works, if faith is alone, it is defined as dead faith. And so the Lord, as uh, when we enter into our faith walk, when we, we get saved, we get born again by grace through faith, right? The Bible tells us to, uh, to, them, uh, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them to them that believe on his name. So everyone who will put their faith in Jesus and receive him as their personal Savior, they become a son of God at that moment. And... So faith alone is all that's required, but if we have faith and, it, and faith is alone, then that is defined by the Bible in James chapter 2 as dead faith. It is faith, faith alone saves, but we don't, we're commanded not to have dead faith, which again, dead faith is faith that is alone. So we are encouraged as Christians to add to our faith, to uh be better Christians, to work on the Christian virtues, to be a to follow the commandments and teachings of the Word of God. That is exactly what this chapter is talking about. This is not a litmus test to see if you're not saved. This is a litmus test to see if you're going to get any, any rewards in heaven. This isn't a litmus test to see if you're not saved. It's a litmus test to see if you're if you have anything added to your faith. If, if your faith is alone, the idea is that it's worthless to people around you. It's, it's not doing any good works for the community. It's not doing any good works for your brothers and sisters in Christ. It is alone. And that is the point of the chapter. Again, faith alone saves. So if faith, if it, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Dead faith is faith without works. And faith without works is the only thing that, that saves us. We have to have no works in the equation when it comes to being saved we come to Christ by faith, we trust in Him by faith, and we don't have any works to bring to Him. We, we, uh, faith is all that's required. But um, after we're saved, we are to have lots of works, and those works uh, earn us rewards in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
May this be clear and plain, Lord, uh, as we try to finish up this chapter tonight. May it be a blessing to us. Uh, and Lord, I pray that I would articulate it in such a way that somebody else could explain this to, to someone else, as, as this chapter is one of the most often misquoted, misused uh, chapters that I, I hear when I talk about salvation being a free gift and faith alone, they'll always turn to this chapter or quote this chap one verse out of this chapter out of context to prove to try to prove that you have to have works to save you uh, and not faith alone to get into heaven. And so, Lord, I pray that I would make this clear and may, may, may we all be willing to teach other people in this world that are trusting in their own works uh, and, and to try to get them saved from hell because if they're trusting in their works, even in the smallest sense, Lord, they're going to go to hell, even if they're trusting you and their works. Lord, I pray that you help us all to understand this and be able to explain this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. In verse number one, again, the point is, he says, My brethren, have not faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. So what is he saying? Have faith with your faith. Okay, you're saved. Don't have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. So the concept is, is that when we get saved, we're supposed to have certain things that would go along with our faith. And then there are other things that don't go very good with our faith. It do, that doesn't line up with our faith. Now, we're believers in Christ. We're trusting in Christ. We've, we've been born again into God's family. So he says, don't do this. When, when you're, if you're a person of faith, don't do these things. And he says, don't have respect of persons. So that is uh, what we've been giving commentary on up through verse 17 that we've been dealing with uh, because he, he tells us about how there are rich people that come in and they're treated special, uh, more than the poor. Um, there, this could come out and play out in a church where there could be racism. There could be, uh, you know, people could be treated for all different for all different types of reasons. But when it comes to Christianity, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And if somebody is a brother in Christ, then they should not be treated uh, any different than anyone else in the church when it comes to that. That is what it's saying. Now, there's the next part of it that's very important is that we uh, need to work out our faith, right? We need to live out our faith. We believe, but let it change our life. Let that belief inspire you, uh, the faith in Christ, let it, let it change your life. So again, um, when you get down to verse 12, he points, he, he reveals that this is about rewards. He says, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged of the law of liberty. For he shall, ha uh, he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? We're not talking about eternal salvation, uh, at receiving the gift of eternal life. We're actually talking about uh, faith saving him, faith alone saving him on that day of the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I've covered that pretty extensively in the last week's sermon, so I'm not going to take uh, the time to go through that. But basically, if you have faith alone, you don't have rewards. But we're to add to our faith, and all that we add to our faith, that's basically racking up rewards in heaven. I went through tons of verses last week where Jesus says if you give a glass of water to a brother in Christ in his name, in Jesus' name, you get rewards in heaven. So even the kindest, most humble acts of, of blessing someone uh, is it, it gets you some rewards in heaven. So I think it's, it's pretty easy to get on the scoreboard up in heaven um, as far as that goes. But there are going to be people who have nothing. And they're going to be completely ashamed before the Lord uh, when he comes. Now, again, faith alone saves. But if, it's, if faith is alone, there will be no rewards. People love to say if, if faith is alone, then you're not truly saved. But that's not what it says. They love to quote verse 17. We're getting down to verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. And they'll quote the other verses we're going to cover tonight as well. But again, uh, they'll say, if your faith is dead, then you're not saved. They say dead faith equals not saved. Okay, but that's not the case. Because it says faith alone is, the Bible says that, that, all, that, that all we have to have is faith alone to be saved. So the Bible is clear. Faith 
uh, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. So dead faith is faith without works. But it's still faith. Okay, now I want to turn to 2 Peter, um, and I want to give you the concept here, 2 Peter chapter 1, because if your faith is dead, uh, then you're not getting rewards. You're not, you're not growing as a Christian. You're not uh, doing anything for the cause of Christ. So again, let me show you the true context of if you have faith without works, this is what happens. It tells us in 2 Peter, uh, did I say 1 Peter? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Very similar to James chapter 2, where he says, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. So the concept is, is we're supposed to add to our faith. Our faith alone saves us. It's the foundation. But he tells us to build upon that foundation. Gold, silver, precious stones. So he says this, he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, which is what we're discussing now in James chapter 2, uh, and then to brotherly kindness charity, for if these things be in you abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here again is the same concept, so here it is. If you have faith, you need to add to it. You, you're building upon it, right? You have faith, and you add to your faith virtue. So you, you work on cleaning your life up, getting all the junk out of your life, all the sin. And to that, you, you add to your faith knowledge. You know, we need to be people that care about the truth. We need to be studying our Bible to be a good student of the Word of God. And he says, from there, you add to your faith temperance. Self-control, not indulging yourself, just, you know, uh, and all these things. And I'm not going to go through all of them. Patience and so forth. He goes through these things. This is the, the Christian life in a nutshell. We're supposed to be, be getting better and better and better. Uh, and so he, he said there's two scenarios. If you, if these things be in you and abound, he, this shall make you uh, neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to grow and grow and grow as a Christian. You're going to be a, a, a tree plant like this planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season, okay? But if you have, that is by definition, faith that has works, okay? That's not dead faith. So the, the, this is not dead faith. This is living faith, according to our passage in James chapter 2. Living faith is, uh, you know, faith that adds to it, right? Adds works, adds all of these things that the Bible says here. And then it tells us what happens if we do not add to our faith, which would be that by definition, James chapter 2, dead faith. So he says in verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind. So if you have dead faith, it doesn't mean you're not saved because faith alone saves you, but there is a blindness there. There's a blindness there. They cannot see afar off. They can't see their own sin. They can't see clearly. Now, what is it that they can't see? Well, I think that we could go back to James chapter 2 as well, and as it talks about the law of liberty. Later in James, it talks about the per looking into the perfect law of liberty so that you can basically see who you are. The Bible reveals who we are, uh, and, and it reveals who God is, and it shows us where our character flaws are, where our sins are, and, and it, it changes us, right, as we add to our faith virtue and all of these things. But if we're not adding to our faith these things, then what happens? There's a blindness. It's like the, James gives it as the, uh, the idea of going up to the mirror, looking in it, you're beholding your natural face in the glass, and then just going forth and forgetting what manner of man you are, what you look like. You didn't comb your hair. You didn't change anything about it. You just go into the world, and nothing changes at all. When we're supposed to take a good, hard look at the Word of God, at the perfect law of liberty, and it reflects back who we are compared to God, and his standard, and then we become, we, can, we have that choice to, to add to our faith and, and like, you know, build up and say, you know what, uh, look, I read my Bible a day and I, I get convicted 
Uh, I, I was talking to somebody and I used a word I shouldn't. And you know what? I feel bad about that. I'm going to add to my faith. I'm not going to do that anymore. I was, um, you know, I, I was thinking in a certain way. I had a bad attitude. I was, you know, it wasn't right how I talked to my spouse or whatever. And, and you add to your faith. And that's what the word of God does for us. But if you don't add to your faith, if you lack these things, you're blind and cannot see afar off. And I believe he's saying that this is like the, the ultimate of this, hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So it's possible where the, 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 the point when you got saved, you, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ becomes like a, a memory, a distant memory that's not really right there. You're not thinking about it all the time. As a Christian that's serving God, reading their Bible every day, going to church, it, it should never be like a thing that's far from your mind that the Lord has forgiven you of your old sins. I mean, praise God, once you're saved, you're always saved. And we're, we're talking to God and confessing our sins that, that we do, and we're trying to add to our faith. But there are people who just literally go through their life, and they have no thought about spirituality. They have no thought of God. They have no idea. They don't, they're not thinking about adding to their faith at all. They're just living in the flesh constantly. And by definition, that is faith without works, and it is a dead faith. And in the sense that there's going to be no uh, growth and no rewards for that person. And that person is sitting in a place of blindness. They're going to just be sideswiped. I mean, there are Christians out there that have been living by, uh, that have been saved by faith alone, and I met them. And they're getting mixed up in all kinds of weird false doctrines. They're into all kinds of sin. And I pray for them and I tell them, like, you need to get right with God, get back into church, get back into reading your Bible, and so on. But they are blind and they cannot see afar off. And it's just not even in their thought process that God forgave them. So this is the idea of faith without works. It's dead. It's worthless. It is, it, you know, to, as far as the world's concerned, by the way, I, it, again, faith alone is all that saves you. And it, it says this person that doesn't have, all, it hasn't added anything to their faith. This, this chapter right here says, tells us that this person who hasn't added a thing to their faith, they lacketh these things. They forgot that their sins were purged, uh, that he was purged, past hits. When you get saved, all your sins are purged. And if you add nothing to your faith, this person's sitting there blind, not doing anything for God. They're not seeing who, themselves. They can't. They don't even realize all, how bad their sins are, and uh, they're just living that life. I, I hope this is just really, uh, you know, clear tonight, and, and uh, that it's a blessing to you. Now, uh, people will often argue, and they'll read James chapter two. And they'll quote Galatians chapter 5, and they'll say, well, I just don't think so-and-so is saved because they don't have the fruit to back it up. I don't see any fruit. But as I pointed out a few weeks ago, but the, what is James chapter 5 saying? Okay, What are the fruits of the Spirit in James chapter 5, the love and joy and peace and all of those? Are these automatic when you get saved? No, because you have to be Walking in the Spirit to have those fruit. That's why it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of being filled with the Spirit, or walking in the Spirit, is love, joy, and peace, and all of these things. But if you don't add to your faith, if you're not actively trying to add uh, to your faith, you're not going to get those fruit. You're not going to get those fruit. Again, this all ties together to James chapter 2. The fruit of the Spirit is when you walk in the Spirit and you can be saved by faith and you can, you can live and have a dead faith and have no fruits of the Spirit. And so again, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. And there is no love, there's no joy, no peace, no long-suffering. There's no, none of the virtues that the Bible talks about, adding to your faith and temperance and uh, all of these things, virtue and uh, you know, um, temperance and charity and kindness, brotherly kindness and so forth. All right, now, again, if you read this verse, uh, James chapter 2, 17, clearly, the issue is not salvation. The book itself is addressed to save believing Christians. So what is the definition of dead faith? I want to just reiterate this again as we close out this chapter. It is faith that is alone. It is faith in Jesus 
uh, it is faith in Jesus that has no works accompanying it. If you have sincere faith in Christ but don't do any works for God, you don't lose your salvation, you lose your rewards. This is the essence of what the chapter is about. Verse uh, 14, I already pointed this out. What does it profit, my brethren, though if a man, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Well, is, is this talking about saving faith, of being, being born again into the family of God? No. Okay, that happens the moment we believe on Christ. But what's it saying? Uh, is referring to the last few verses where it says that we are going to be judged of God at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 15, it says, If a brother or sister be naked or destitute of daily food, and if one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which, ye are, are, which are needful to the body, what does the prophet? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Dead faith is faith alone, without any works required. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Dead faith is faith alone, without any works to accompany that faith. I said that wrong. I want to make sure. Dead faith is faith, and faith alone saves, but it just doesn't, dead faith has no works going along with it. What saves us? Remember, I just want to give you these verses again. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, not by works of righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace he is saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 3.28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, period. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Romans 4.5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now let's uh, continue in James chapter 2, verse number 18. The Bible says, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I, I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, mark that word show there, and, and think about that word, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, this is important uh, because the fact is, is that I can't show you my faith. Now, I could tell you my faith. I put my faith in Jesus Christ when I was a nine-year-old boy in a little city called Hickson, Tennessee. I kneeled by my father at the couch in the living room of a trailer next to Moses Road Baptist Church. I can tell you that, but I can't show you my faith because faith is something that is inside my heart. And so you say, well, I'll show you my faith. You can't show me your faith, okay? It's impossible. So he says, show me your faith without, your, without any works. You can't show somebody your, fa your faith. So he says, I'll show someone my faith by my works. So again, he's basically saying, look, people can't see your faith. So live like a Christian should and ought to be a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And people will see that you have faith. I think this is pretty clear. I don't know why this ch this chapter gets so gets people so mixed up. But there's so much false preaching on this chapter. Um, our faith is supposed to show in the way we live our life. Otherwise, they're just you know it, it, they're just words to people. You know, I'm a believer, and they're like, "Weren't you at the strip club on Friday night? What's wrong with you?" Like, you're a Christian? That's not, that's not what I think of when I think of Christians. So we're supposed to show the world that we have faith. And we do that by adding to our faith and living like a Christian. Allowing God to change us and be a better person. So who are these Christians? Who, 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 are, who we are as Christians is supposed to show out. We're supposed to let the Lord change us. Um, now, notice that word show, okay? And we're going to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. But while we're turning there, let me tell you the story. Let me remind you of the story. Jesus, um, 
Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll get to that in one second. I think that's in here. Is that in here? Let me double check. Maybe I didn't put it in my notes. Oh. Well, sorry about that. I'll just tell the story then if I didn't put it in here. Well, anyway, so Jesus came and uh, they brought a lame man to Jesus and he took, they took him uh, to him and when he came to be healed, he said to them, he said to him, your sins, thy sins be forgiven thee. And they said, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, this man speaketh blasphemy. There is only one that can forgive sins, even God. And, you know, Jesus, of course, that was the whole point. Right? And so they couldn't see that this man's sin debt had just been blotted out of the books in heaven. And that all his sins were forgiven and he was washed in the blood of the Lamb. Right? They couldn't see that. They couldn't see that he was a new man, a new creature on the inside. So the Lord said, um, I can't quote it perfectly, but he said, so that people can know that God has, that has power on earth to forgive sins, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. So he was making a point. He said, listen, you know, I just forgave this man of his sin debt. You got angry and said, I can't do that because I'm not God. So watch this. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. So this man gets up, and now he's living proof. Only God could do both of those miracles. And so the, the thought was, it was put into everybody's mind is like, whoa, if he can make this man rise up and walk, he can also forgive sins on the inside. You know, And so it's a great uh, way to look at this and to say, that's how we, how we as Christians are. If God can take us old rotten sinners and make something special and unique and different and peculiar in this rotten world where you see these people that are living for God and they're different than the world, not going along. Everybody in the world is listening to the same junk music, watching the same junk uh, shows and all the junk. And you got this group of Christians out there serving God, living holy lives, living clean lives, raising their families different. That's a testimony that, that the Lord is at work and he's real. And so First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, the Bible says, But ye are a chosen generation, speaking to Christians, believers in Christ, a royal priesthood and holy nation and a peculiar people that ye should show, mark that word, show. Remember, he said, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. Impossible. You can't show somebody your faith. So he says, I'm going to show, he said, I will show you my faith by my works. I can't show you my faith, but I can do works. And you can, people can make assumptions and say, hey, I see that this person's living like a Christian. This guy's probably a Christian. Okay? So, that ye should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Christians are supposed to be a peculiar people. I mean, people are supposed to look at Christians and say, what are they doing? Why are they out on Sunday afternoon knocking doors? Why are they, why are they living differently? Why look, everybody drinks. Why, why is this guy sitting, you know, why does he not want to be around the drinking party on Friday night? Why won't old so-and-so come down there anymore? I, I don't understand. Why I haven't seen him at the club in years. I you know, he just, you know, he's just a different type of person. You know what? We're a royal priesthood. We are a peculiar people. We're a holy nation. We're ambassadors from a heavenly kingdom, the Bible says. So that we can show forth the Lord's marvelous light from our lives. So that we can show, show. The Lord wants us to show the world our faith by our works. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And by the way, if you want to make a difference in this world, I mean, I'm not talking about saving the trees or something. You know, making the oceans clean. I'm talking about saving souls. If you want to make a difference in this world, you have to be willing to be different. And that's what Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says. Ye are the light of the world. 
but or excuse me, you're the, I, I skipped ahead. Let's go verse 13. You're the salt of the earth, but if the, if salt, the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing. But to be cast out, to be trodden foot under foot of men. Now, again, here's a, this is a theme that Jesus gives throughout the Bible. These are like the, the, the branches that are cut off that don't have any fruit. They're thrown into the, to the ground and, and they're burned in the fire to make you know, compost or whatever. Okay, So he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if it has no savor, if it doesn't have... If, if it's lost its potency, if, if it doesn't sting when you put it on a sore, if it doesn't preserve uh, meat when you put it onto it, if it doesn't add flavor to the food, then it's what good is it? You don't want it anymore. You just throw it out. And the Bible says that's what a Christian is. It's, it, there are good for nothing Christians who don't have an added to their faith. Their, their faith is without works. And so they're basically like salt that has lost its savor. So what is a what is a, faith, a person that has faith without works? They're saved. They're just a good for nothing Christian. Okay. And then go on. Ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that, men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what, is it, what are we supposed to do as Christians? We're supposed to live like God wants us to live so that we can glorify God. It's really simple, right? So that's the, that's the whole point of uh, James. If you want to make a difference, you're going to have to be willing to be different. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this, to the world, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're supposed to be transformed. We're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed, like completely different than this world. Okay? Back to James chapter 2 as I try to finish up here. James 2 verse 19. Another verse that gets really people gets people really confused. And I, again, as we read this in context, we look at it all in context, it's not that hard to understand. James 2 verse 19. Thou believest there, that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. Again, many people quote this verse. I mean, this Ray Comfort guy always says this. Uh, he, there's this video where he's got this lady, and she says, I, he said, are you going to heaven or something like that? And she said, yes. And he said, How, why do you think you're going to heaven? Because I have faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it's something like she said. And he said, do you sin? And she said, well, yes, I sin. I'm a sinner. We are, we're all sinners. She said, he said, you're going to hell then, you know, in his uh, Australian accent. She said, no. She said, no, honey, I've been born again. I've been forgiven of all my sins. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. I can't go to hell. I'm saved. And he was arguing with her and saying, trying to point out sins that were in her life, asking her if she smoked or if she did sins in her life, and basically saying she was unsaved because she sinned. Well, guess what? If that's the standard, then we're all sinners, even Ray Comfort. So he's not saved. Well, he, I, I would actually agree with that, but not because he doesn't have works. It's because he doesn't have faith. Ray Comfort, let me say that again. Ray Comfort's not saved because he doesn't have faith alone in Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. He's trusting in his faith and his works. You see, your works are, are to come after your faith after faith alone saves you, but if you add works on this side of salvation, salvation's here, born, being born again. If you put works on this side, you're not saved. But if you come in with faith and then you have no works, then you're saved. You're 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 a dead. You have dead faith. If you come in and you have uh, works, uh, you get saved by faith, and you have uh, works, then you have a living faith, according to the Bible, and many rewards. All right, so what does this verse mean? Because he'll say, you, you know, he even said this, I think, to the woman. Well, the devils even believe and tremble, you know, and they always quote it wrong, too. Well, the Bible says the devil, first point, right? You know, believing in that there is one God 
does not save you. That's a fact. There is one God. Believing that Jesus existed, that, you know, Jesus was a good man or, or, or whatever, Jesus rose from the dead, doesn't save you. It's putting your faith and your trust in Jesus and believing on him that saves you. So their point is invalid, to, to be clear, it's invalid on that point alone because when we get, we get saved when we put our faith in. And there's not one devil that is, has come to Jesus by faith and prayed that sinner's prayer. Lord, I believe in you. I trust in you with all my heart, best as I know how. I believe on you. I, 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 there's, I, I'm not trusting in anything else. Please save me and take me to heaven when I die. That is not what, I'm, what he's saying here. It, there's no devil that came to, to Jesus and uh, comes to Jesus and says that. Okay? Number two. No, that was my number two. Sorry. So the point is, is that faith is not a, faith alone is enough to save us. Okay. Um. But their point, the point they make, is that faith is not alone, or faith is not enough to save us. That's essentially what these people are saying, and this is the category. Uh, that's why I'm so hard on these lordship salvation types, these Ray Comforts and all these preachers out there preaching. You got to turn from your sins and all of that, because in in uh, Galatians chapter one it says, if any man bring another gospel, uh, he says, let him be accursed. You know, just let them, you know, basically go to hell with their false gospel. They're preaching another gospel. Of course, we'll try to get them saved. You know, if we if we can, you know, we we come across these false gospels all the time. But I'm talking like a lot of these false prophets out there on YouTube that are damning souls to hell. Let them be accursed. So they point they they like to say that faith is not enough to save us. Otherwise, the devils would be saved. That's ridiculous. But the point is, what this verse is actually saying is that hey, faith is a good thing, but we should it shouldn't just be alone. We shouldn't just have a salvation without being serious and working hard for the Lord. Again, this chapter is not about how to be saved. Now, verse 20. But thou wilt, O vain man, thou, excuse me, but thou wilt know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Okay? Listen, we're supposed to have works. All right? Again, faith without works is dead. Dead faith faith what is the definition of dead faith it's faith that is alone having no works we don't have to have any works to get saved but once we're saved we're supposed to have works uh, and earn some rewards in heaven and be a good christian down here okay to be very clear but notice how he called he accuses this person that is without works of being a vain man now i looked up the word vain in the Webster's 1828, and the first and second definition are empty, worthless, and having no sus substance, value, or importance. Well, that pretty much fits perfectly with what, what we're calling this person that has no works to go along with their faith. The, third, the second one is, definition is, fruitless, ineffectual. Um, yeah, fruitless and ineffectual. And so... Again, uh, that ties in perfectly with our understanding of this passage that if, if you have faith without works, you're a vain person, you're, it's, it's empty, you're carnal, it's, it's, just, it's just a window dressing, you have faith, you trust in Christ, you name the name of Christ, you believed on him, but you're vain, you're, just, you're empty, you're not bringing forth any fruit, you're ineffectual as a Christian, you're a worthless Christian, a good-for-nothing Christian, Right, having no value or importance in the Christian realm, uh, and and that's not what we should have, right? And again, tying this all together, verse fourteen: What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? You know, like faith alone is not going to get you any rewards in heaven, but it, it gets you into heaven. Praise God. Uh, even so, faith, if it hath not works, verse 17, is dead, being alone. Verse 20, but that wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Okay? Faith to, the faith to be saved is there. It's just alone. 
John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Anyone who comes to the Lord, God has given them the power to become the sons of God by simple faith and belief in him. Now the next section, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac upon uh, his son upon the altar? Seeth thou how, how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see how then how that uh, by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So this is where, again, a section where people get very confused. So they point to Abraham in the example of Abraham offering his son Isaac upon the altar okay verse 21 now the question is that we have to ask is and and this has confused a lot of people but i don't believe it's fair it's, it's confusing in context hold your place there we're going to turn back to romans chapter 4 and we're going to understand what this really is talking about as we lay this all out as we've laid it out and brought it up to this point it's not that confusing it should be that confusing to us now notice here in romans chapter 4 verse 1 it speaks about, it's, this is what someone has told me was, uh, is uh, an apparent contradiction, and the answer is there has to be some works and some faith. But that's not the answer, to be saved and have eternal life. The answer is, is that this, Romans chapter 4 is talking about how to be born again into God's family, to have eternal life, and James chapter 2 is talking about how to be a good Christian and add to our faith that our faith wouldn't be empty. Now, in Romans chapter 4, it says, what, verse 1, What shall we say then that, uh, that father Abraham our father as pertaining the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. So this is very important because th this phrase, not before God, is very important. Because when, when you read James chapter 1, or James chapter 2, it's all about your faith being uh, seen before men having your faith not be a dead faith because you can't he said i'll show you why don't you try, try just try showing somebody your faith without having any works you can't you can say i'm a christian all day long i'm a believer all day long and but people don't see any fruits of the spirit any any goodness any any decency any any uh uh spiritual growth that people are gonna uh, in the world are gonna see uh not gonna see your faith and so he's just encouraging us to add to our faith and let, let our faith become profitable to the people around us. Uh, if somebody comes to you and, has, and, and a brother in Christ and says, hey, I need food this week, I don't have food for my family, and you say, hey, that a boy, buddy, you know, God will provide, and you don't actually provide some food for him when you can do that, then he's saying your faith is vain. It's, 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 you're not living the way you should as a Christian, and you know it calls into question, right? You, you can't see your faith. So when, when James chapter 2, he's talking about faith, uh, uh, people that are saved, okay, uh, showing the world that they have faith, okay, by their works. But in Romans chapter 4, we see that Abraham was justified, it, it was not justified by works, but notice this, if Abraham were justified by works, didn't it James just say that Abraham was justified by works in James 2.21? Well, what, what's he talking about? Well, it very, it's very clear. If J Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. You see, glory means to boast. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast or glory. We can't boast about our salvation. And, and, you know, so Abraham did great works for God, okay? Notice this, but he was not justified before God with his works. The only way we're justified before God, the Bible tells us we are not justified by the works of the law. The Bible tells us the only way we're justified by God before God is the Bible says knowing that there, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh 
be justified. Faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, that's what saves us. So he goes on to say, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So when we get saved, our sins are washed away, and the record of Jesus Christ is imputed to us. His righteousness is imputed to our account. Our name is blotted out of the books of the, of the damned in Revelation 20. And we are, our name is in that book of life sealed with no sins on our account. We are forgiven. We're justified. Just as if I were never even a sinner under the record of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So that was when Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. In verse 4 it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So when we go back to James chapter uh, 2, when it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac up, uh, Isaac his son upon the altar, right? So what are we talking about? Well, we're not talking about being ju justified before God because the only thing, if you try to do works to be justified before God, God says, no, your works are worthless to me as far as salvation. Jesus did all the work on the cross for salvation. So what's he talking about here? Okay, this is being justified before the world. J Abraham's faith... Uh, was seen by the whole world, and he, and, and he got into J uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and it says, By faith Abraham offered up his son Isaac. His faith is something that is an inspiration to all Christians around the world. And he was willing to give up everything for, for Jesus Christ, for, for God. He was willing to, to leave out, not knowing whither he went, and uh, just obey God, to, to with, leaving behind fears and worries and just saying, God, I'm just going to go and do whatever you want me to do. His faith was basically justified, was justified before the whole world. He wasn't just a, a, a guy who had faith. He, he wasn't a guy with dead faith. He wasn't a guy that had no, no added things to his Christianity. He was not a guy who just was just another guy that was uh, saved but was just living like the world. No, this guy... Uh, really worked out his own salvation, really worked in his life to be a good Christian. That's what it's talking about. That's why he says in verse 22, Seeth thou, thou how faith wrought with his works, and that uh, and by works was faith made perfect. Okay? So faith, the, the word perfect again, has to do with that mere maturity, right? So he gets saved. He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, this is back in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to him, Abraham, uh, you know, he calls him out and he says, I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse them that curse thee and so forth. And he tells him to go out from the land that he was at. Abraham had faith back when he was in Ur of the Chaldees, back over in basically the area of Babylon. And he was at faith back then when he trusted in Christ. And this story that's brought up uh, in chapter 13, by the way, it says that Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. So he, he is a believer. He, he's put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ all the way back in, in chapter 12 or earlier. We don't know exactly uh, the, when he got saved, but it was clear that he got saved before that time. And, and now, uh, some 25 to 30 years later, uh, Abraham, God tells Abraham, after Abraham's been desperate to have this son that God pro promised him. He's supposed to be the father of many nations with, with, the, with the descendants uh, numbering to the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, but he doesn't have a child. And so he's begging God for a child. He has this personal walk with God. And uh, he gets his child finally in his old age, some 25 to 30 years later, and God says, I want you to go sacrifice your only son. And Abraham was willing to do that. And you know the story how the Lord said, I'll provide a, 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 you know, a, a lamb for you or a sacrifice for you. And, uh, and, and he did. And, and he, God sent a ram uh, to, for the sacrifice. And God didn't allow him, of course, to sacrifice his, his firstborn son. It was all a picture 
of the substitutionary. It's a whole beautiful picture of Christ and substitution and, and I, uh, with all of that. Now, anyway, so faith was wrought in his work. Faith was made perfect. He had faith alone that saved him, but he came to maturity through his works. He came to a spiritual maturity. He added to his faith. He didn't just live in darkness, blindness, cannot see afar off, forgetting he was even saved. No, he added to his faith. And the scriptures were fulfilled, which said, verse 23, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Ye see then how that works is, uh, by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Again, by faith alone is how we're justified before God, Romans 4. But before men, so that they may see that God has power on earth to forgive sins. That they may see that there is a Savior who died for them. We're supposed to live like, like Christ wanted us to. Christ was different. Crowds would come out to see him. We're supposed to be different. And we're supposed to make an impact in people's lives. All right. Let's finish up. James is talking about our faith being seen of the world and us being justified before men. Our faith should have works. We can't just be a vain Christian, a worthless, unfruitful Christian. Verse 25 and 26, For Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Rahab believed on the Lord. She was a believer. She, she trusted in Christ without the name of Christ, right? But she was justified by works. She, she showed she was a believer. She showed everybody that she was a believer. I mean, she's mentioned for saving those spies. They were hunting these spies, and she hid them up on the roof and helped them sneak out of the country and save their lives out of Jericho. And so what did she do? She was a believer, she showed that she acted like a believer and she put her own life on the line to save those spies, to, to save those God's people, right? She helped those people. And so she acted like a Christian. She did what a Christian should do. And she was rewarded for that. And her name is, her legacy lives on. And your legacy will live on as a Christian if you'll add to your faith. Your legacy as a Christian and as a believer is not going to live on if you don't add to your faith. If you don't grow as a Christian, if you don't aren't trying. You know, people that just don't go to church, don't read their Bible, don't don't even try to be a good person, don't try to change how they live, don't make corrections here and there to, when when the Lord shows them things, they're not going to have the, those rewards in heaven. They're not going to have. Uh, they're not going to be recognized in their faith. For the as the body without the spirit is dead. So uh, faith without works is dead also. And he says the definition is faith. Okay, this is an important point. Um, people will often say faith, uh, dead faith is faith that's, that's not saving faith. They'll often say, you know, uh, it wasn't a saving faith. You know, if it doesn't have works, it wasn't a saving faith. Well, that's not true because it, a body is still a body. Okay? Um, you, you don't say, oh, look, there's no body there. It can be a dead body, but it's a, it's a body. He wants us to live. He wants to rise up, take our cross, and follow him. So faith without works is dead also. Just like he said in verse 17, he defines it. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. We're not to have alone faith. We're not supposed to have, we're supposed to have faith alone when we get saved. Faith is all it re required. But once we're saved, we need to add to our faith works so that our light may shine before men so that they may glorify God, so they might see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. That's what we are to do. I hope this has been a blessing and a help, and I uh, hope this has maybe given you some ways to explain this to people uh, that, that are mixed up on this. But this is a big issue. And um, I know that there's a lot of people confused on this, so I hope this will be a, has been a help to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as best as I know how, I've, I've explained this and laid this all out for people tonight. I pray, Lord, that, uh, that, that people would even find this online that are, are struggling. Um, 
with this idea and they would get this cleared up and get saved and uh, be trusting in you in faith alone, Lord. And um, I, I, others may see it, Lord. I pray that we would all take this to heart and explain this to people and show people uh, these scriptures, Lord, as we uh, they've been presented tonight. Lord, help us to be able to explain these things clearly and articulately. And Lord, I thank you for all you do. We love you in Jesus.